Hi, this is Jason Watt from Business Career College. I'm uh, going to try and show in this video what's happening with GameStop. I'm recording this video on the morning of Thursday, January 28th, before the markets have opened. So who knows what happens in the next little while. Uh, but the, uh, this is not intended as any sort of uh, trading advice or securities advice or anything like that. Uh, by no means do I endorse the use of short selling or hedge funds, uh, nor do I say people shouldn't uh, sell short or use hedge funds. Uh, everything is appropriate in its place. And I do believe that before you're using such uh, strategies, even individual securities ownership, you should be reasonably well educated about the risks associated with an investment. So uh, let's have a look at what's going on with GameStop here. I'm going to build a little analogy and we'll see if this works or a, a sort of miniature case study for this. So the actual uh, sort of corporation here, and I'm just gonna use GameStop, but I'm going to sort of boil it down. Let's say that GameStop for the sake of argument is a small business. So I've got uh, GameStop here and we're gonna just give it a hundred shares. So here's what we would have. It has sort of the insiders. These are the folks who are uh, actually associated with the running of the company and the insiders maybe own 20 shares. And it doesn't really matter what these numbers are, but then we're going to have the general public, and this is the sort of material item to this, the general public that has access to 80 shares. So in total, the overall ownership of Game Shop or GameStop, sorry, uh, comprises 100 shares. And this is pretty typical for publicly traded companies like this. The numbers are obviously way out of whack. Uh, there are, if I rem remember correctly, about 80 million shares of uh, GameStop actually in circulation. Uh, you'll sometimes hear the word float, and the float is basically the number of shares or the, the quantity of shares that can be purchased by the general public. So the insiders could sell their shares. There's no restriction on the insiders selling their shares, uh, except that they have to disclose when they do so, and they can't sell their shares when they have information that others would not have access to. And when insiders sell shares, because it has to be disclosed, this also creates uh, a sense amongst the general share buying public that the insiders no longer have faith or that the company is overvalued and that often triggers uh, a share sell-off by others. So the insiders do have something of a responsibility in how they behave with respect to those shares that they own. Now, I would suggest that unlike a lot of the sort of traditional stories we have around uh, events like this, around share buying, the corporation is pretty much a bystander here. It's not really doing anything, although what is notable with GameStop and what's going to be material when we look at the sort of next step here is that it's had a rough go. Like a lot of retailers, it's had a rough go lately. And there are some questions about its viability as a company or its viability as a business. And we don't really need to get into any sort of financials here. Lots of people uh, have done this and there's lots of information out there. You can just go to uh, Google Finance or Yahoo Finance and you can look at their 2020 results. Although there are some bright spots in there, there's also some issues. And I don't wanna get into the viability of this company. Honestly, it's not terribly material to this story. Although for some players, uh, Michael Burry, I'll use Michael Burry, he's famous from, of course, the uh, Big Short, um, and he's somebody who did buy into the business because he had faith in its sort of long-term prospects. Okay, so here's where we get into the first kind of stage of the complexity associated with this thing. If you're what's called a short seller, and anybody can do this, although you have to have a margin account to do this, but if you're a short seller, what's going to happen here is you look at this and you say, yeah, this company, this GameStop company, it's had a bad go lately. So we ask the question of whether it's a viable business. And 
let's say the best time, of course, to sell a share is before it uh, drops in value, right? We always want to buy low and sell high. And that's what the short seller is going to take advantage of here. So let's say for the sake of argument that we look at the shares of GameStop and they're trading at $3 a share, just to have a price here. So these shares are at $3 a share. And I've looked at the financials for GameStop and I say, I think it's in trouble. Here's what I'm going to do. I'm gonna go borrow. And this is really what happens. I'm gonna borrow, let's say 10 shares. I can get my hands on 10 shares. I'm gonna borrow those from my broker. And this is done through some sort of financial intermediary. So I'm an investor and I'm gonna to go to my broker. I say, can you get your hands on 10 shares of GameStop for me? Now, depending on how many shares are actually transacted here, this could drive the price up a little bit because you have somebody who's trying to buy a bunch of shares. And when you buy a bunch of shares, that drives the price up. So we're gonna go borrow 10 shares and then we immediately sell those shares. Now let's say that we don't drive the price up or we don't drive it up very much. So we immediately sell those shares at uh, 10 bucks a share. And now the investor in this case has a couple of things that they have to concern themselves with. The investor, first off, they have cash now. They, has, they have, sorry, uh, $30. They sold 10 shares at three bucks a share. They owe the broker not $30. And this is where we often get confused with short selling. What they really owe the broker here is 10 shares. Think of somebody who borrowed your favorite pen. You don't want back $2 or whatever the cost of that pen is. You want back your pen. And that's what the broker wants back here. That's how this whole setup works. Now, during the period of ownership of those shares, uh, the broker is going without any dividends they would have gotten on those shares. You also have to make that up to the broker. So you pay any missed dividends to the broker. And that's generally not that consequential. Typically the holding period for short transactions is relatively short. You might end up paying one or two of the missed dividends here, but the broker is going without that income and they want to make sure that they get that. Okay, so then this is where this gets a little bit more uh, complicated. Because effectively what you've done here, you borrowed these shares from your broker. This is a form of leverage. Your broker is a lender now. Now there are rules around this for retail investors, for the hedge funds that we see on the other side of this transaction. It's not so clear, but there is a, there's a set of rules here and really the broker is concerned. The broker says, I'll only do this transaction if I have a good degree of security here. Because right now, the broker is owed uh, shares that are worth $30. And the broker says, I have to make sure that I have some other securities or some other sort of uh, collateral that I can grab based on what happens with your $30. So what does that mean? Well, we probably have other securities that are held with this broker that the broker could potentially sell if they were concerned about your ability to sustain this position. And this is where we're going to run into the, the challenge here. So now we have this investor, this investor owes the broker 10 shares. Now, this means that there are another block of shares out there. We have 70 shares that are still being sort of transacted. And really, the, even the 10 shares that uh, comprise the short position are now back on the market. So we have the uh, broker, sorry, I apologize, the investor who has uh, this debt of 10 shares. And we have 80 shares that are on the market, let's say. Now, what we often see with these short sellers is the short sellers, once they take this position, and this is where there is some question about the, the viability of short selling models, but this kind of thing has been very common. 
And a lot of people who are sort of, if there's sides in this, uh, a lot of people who are on the side of the short sellers will say it was material that short sellers were kind of a key to exposing what happened at Enron, which was quite a while ago now, almost 20 years ago, if memory serves. Um, and that type of thing does everybody a service because it really allows us to look for the weaknesses in business models. Of course, uh, anybody who's followed the Tesla story for the last few years knows that there are lots of short sellers of Tesla and they're sort of in the business of taking short positions and then releasing these reports that uh, flag some weakness in Tesla's business model. And again, this is not securities advice. I'm not at all intending that people take action based on what I'm talking about here. So the, the short seller, they've taken this short position and now they make some information public. And this is very common. And maybe what we get now is another uh, short seller piles on. So maybe we get another short seller who does the same thing. And they might go and do exactly the same thing. They borrow 10 shares from their broker and they immediately sell those shares. Now there's gonna be a little bit of pressure both ways here because now you might have short sellers who seek to buy those shares, which would drive up the share price. But the theory here is that when that information becomes public, that there's this weakness with the business model, that's what's going to drive down the share price. And that's really what the investors want. So the intention for these investors would be that the share price gets to, for the sake of argument, uh, $2. So this is our sort of intended outcome, that the share price hits $2. And then the short sellers, the investors, buy back the shares that they had, that they owe to their brokers. So they're gonna buy the 10 shares each and they repay their brokers and they're left with 10 bucks each. They originally, owe, or they originally borrowed $30 worth of shares. They were able to repay that debt with just $20 worth of shares. So your profit here is $10 per investor or a buck a share. And obviously the more the share price falls, the more that profit is. So that's sort of the balancing act you wanna strike here. You wanna drive down that share price and have that opportunity then to buy back the shares at a, at a, a significantly discounted price and then be able to repay the broker. Okay, but here's where we run into the issue. So now we've got these 80 shares on the market. And in this case, uh, it's Reddit. This is not the first time we've had a story like this. I'm sure a lot of people who are watching this video will have read that uh, Volkswagen and Porsche kind of went through something similar in 2010. But at very, for a very brief period, owing to what I'm about to show you, uh, Volkswagen became the world's largest publicly traded company in 2010. So now with these 80 shares on the market, here's what happens. We have other investors. So our sort of investor pool number two, and they say, we think there's an opportunity here to make some money. And they go and they take a long position, that is they buy shares of GameStop. And they put the word out that there's this short sell on. So they get other investors excited about this. And this is what's happened on that Reddit thread, the now famous Reddit thread, which is closed as of this moment, if I have my information correct. Uh, but this famous Reddit thread, uh, Wall Street Bets. And now when they get these other folks excited, we get other investors who buy. So this original group bought at $3 thereabouts, something like $3, let's say. And now we get these other investors excited. So they start to buy at $5, at $10, at $20. This, all this buying activity, this sort of frenzy drives up the share price. Okay, now let's rewind back to the broker for a moment here. So your broker lent you this money knowing that you had this 
collateral that was good when the share price was $3. Let's say the share price gets to $10. So now we have a $10 share price from our original $3 starting point. Okay. And at a $10 share price, your broker knows you need to come up not with $30 now, but your broker knows you would need $100. And the broker says, hey, I was perfectly comfortable lending you money when I knew that the other securities you had with me were worth enough that it was gonna be easy for me to recover that $30. But now it's not, $10, it's not uh, $30 anymore. Now it's $10, it's $100 in total. The other securities, the other collateral you have with me just doesn't cut it. I need you to do one of two things. Either you provide more collateral or you need to exit your position. That is, you need to uh, buy shares at $10 and repay me. And that's what we would refer to as a call, a margin call. And that margin call is something that's well within the broker's rights. So this is where you get this sort of pressure between the investor and the broker where the investor says, no, no, I know the share price is 10 bucks right now, but it's going to fall back down to $3 or it's going to fall back down to $2. This company is worthless, this is the argument the investor is making, it's not my argument, this company is worthless and it's only this sort of brief moment in time when we have this artificially inflated price. And the broker might give the investor a little bit of latitude here and say, okay, sure, that's fine, we'll give you a little bit more time, but when we see the price get to $20, and as has happened with, uh, GameStop, so GameStop's share price pretty much doubled yesterday. Yesterday was Wednesday. And you can see where the investor might have told this story to their broker and might have been able to get a little bit of allowance. But the broker now says, hey, I was okay at $20. I was okay at $30. I was okay at $50. I was okay at $100. I was okay at $190, but we're at $390 now. Uh, that is a huge amount of risk that you're really passing on to me. And that's where we're seeing this short squeeze. The short squeeze is that these investors now are in these positions where they either have to provide more collateral or they need to exit their position. And that's really the, the sort of position that uh, Team Reddit is taking here. Team Reddit uh, now has essentially pushed the share price up to $390 or thereabouts, and they're trying to force the, the short sellers, the investors, to buy at that price in order to exit their positions. Okay. So if we get you know, $390, you can appreciate just how much more risk there is here. And if you uh, owe your uh, broker your 10 shares and you were counting on that costing you $20, but now it's gonna cost you 10 times $390, it'll cost you $3,900. And of course, the scales here are so much larger than anything I've illustrated. We're looking at positions of billions of dollars this is where we have a huge amount of risk for these short sellers. And this is always the case. If you actually, as a retail investor, try to set up a margin account, uh, at least in Canada, you always have to answer the question before you're allowed to set up the, that account, your investment dealer has to ask you, they say, what is the most money you can lose on a margin transaction? And you have to identify that your loss is theoretically unlimited here. And this is a case where the loss has gone beyond the theoretically unlimited to the practically unlimited. All right, I hope that helps. I hope you enjoy your continued studies. Thank you very much.